So the Rails guides are probably something you're familiar with, and in here they mention action text and how to use it. Now it's a work in progress article that will be getting updated uh, even further, but you can follow this to see how action text works and understand a little bit about it. And we're gonna do the same thing and walk through installing this. So action text comes with Rails, so all we have to do is go to our terminal and we run the bin rails uh, action text install or just rails action text install. And we're also going to end up with the active storage migrations as well. So this is going to add um, the JavaScript that's needed for action text. And we can see that if we open up our editor, um, we'll see under app JavaScript, this application JS has been modified to include tricks and rails action text. And then um, we've got a new migration for these. We have the first one here for the active storage tables, which store um, the file uploads and which records they're attached to. And then we've also got the action text tables, which store the rich text uh, themselves. So you can always follow the Rails guides to see the latest version of this or the version that matches your Rails um, version that you're running. So if there's a newer update, there might be new features that you can use with action text. And you might check out the Rails guides for that version. But on version 7.0, all we have to do is go into our blog post model and we can add up here, has rich text, and we can give it a uh, attribute name that we would like. And instead of having a column on our model like we did with body, which was a text column, has rich text is actually going to put it in a separate database table that Rails can manage completely. And this is setting up an association between the two tables. So we can get our blog post and it's gonna be associated and have the actual blog post content somewhere else. Now, as part of this, we can actually move our content that's already in our body column over to the new content field that we have with rich text because they don't use the same name, we can actually reference the old stuff, copy it over to the new content attribute, save that, and then we can get rid of the body and get rid of that entirely. So that's what we can do um, by creating a little migration to go and do that. We could also just completely get rid of the body uh, column as is and recreate the content ourselves, because it's a brand new blog and we don't have any existing data that we must keep. So it's up to us to kind of decide how we want to do that. If we want to keep it all, we can do it that way, or we could just get rid of it because we're you know, in a brand new application and we're free to make some bigger changes like that. But I would like to teach you how to do it where we keep that data around. So in our local machine, we have, let's see, go to the home page. We now have the new migration, so it's gonna make us run these first. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, and then we have four blog posts and you'll see that they have the content being rendered out from the body. So we're gonna need to change our views to render out content instead of body. And then we can write a migration to copy the existing body information over to the new content attribute. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's generate a migration um, called move body to content. <clears throat> or we could say to action text. And we'll just create a new migration with nothing in it because we will want to define our own changes here. Now, because our app is small and we don't have very many blog posts, we are going to do the migration of the blog post content or body to content right here in the migration. If you have a large application, you'll actually want to do this in a multiple steps when you roll out a change like this because it could take hours to migrate the data from one field to another and you might not want to wait hours to deploy your application. So our migrations for us are gonna be very fast because we only have four blog posts or even less in production and uh, this will be super quick, so it's not a big deal. So what we'll do is we'll say uh, blogpost.all.find each and this is a useful practice to do uh, the find each will work like each. However, it is going to grab batches of records and process them at a time. So we'll never load every blog post out of the database. We'll load like a maximum of a thousand, I think is what 
find each does by default. So it would grab a thousand blog posts at a time, load them in memory, and then give you each one to operate on, where we will go and take the body and assign it to the content. And after we're done saving each one of those, we can then drop that column from the database table. So here we will say blog post update. We want the, or actually we want the content to be the blog posts body. And that will go and create the new record on our action text table for each blog post that we have in the database. Then we will want to remove column from the blog post table and the body is what we want to get rid of. So that is going to take care of that for us so that when we run the migration, it will move all that data over and then drop that column that we no longer need. So if we run this database migration, this is going to go through each of those and then uh, move them over. So we can open up the Rails console and grab the last blog post and ask for its content. And it should give you back an action text rich text object from that other table with the uh, body in there that matches the content. So if we ask for content body, it will give us as a string that same content of ASDF um, from our ASDF draft blog post. And it's actually added this div of tricks content around it because it is using HTML for storage of our blog posts and then also for rendering. So we can add kind of any HTML we would want. So we need to actually fix our site now because we're asking for the body to be rendered out but we've removed the body and moved it to the content attribute. So now we can go back to our index view and we'll say instead of body, we'll replace that and say we want to render out content. If we see that, we'll see that now it's back to normal, which is excellent. But if we click on scheduled, we get the same error. We have to go to our show view. We have to change uh, body to content again. And then in our form, we need to change the text area for body to content as well. But instead of using the regular text area, which I'll show you, it will load this, but it will actually show the HTML here. That's not what we actually want to edit. We want the real rich text editor. So we will change this to rich text area, which will render out the action text field. And this is looking a little different where we have this uh, scheduled here, but if we highlight things, we can make it bold. We can make it strike through. We can add a link to it and we can say HTTPS go rails.com and link this up. And now that will be clickable and we can update our blog post and it's going to give us another error. And this time the answer to what went wrong is not as obvious. So let's take a look at this and understand what Rails is trying to tell us here. So there's no method error, undefined method body for blog post. Okay, we remove that column so that method is no longer available. And it happened during the blog post update with the parameters in there. And we can see the parameters printed out in our logs. But what really we need to see here is the full trace. So you can click on this and you can read through these lines and kind of see what Rails was doing when this error uh, happened. And if we look, the second and third and fourth lines here are all in validator.rb inside of active model, which tells you this error probably happened because our validations were not updated to look at content instead of body. That's exactly what happened. So we can also look through these logs and we'll see that it happened during callbacks and you'll notice validations is mentioned here and that all happens after we call update in our blog post controller. So the regular application trace here will filter out all of the code lines in your error to only stuff that you wrote, which is useful sometimes but not useful if something breaks inside of Rails or another gem. So you'll often want to look at the full trace and see what was actually blowing up and when's the last line of code that I wrote and what was it doing? It was calling update, which goes into active record and active record runs its validations and tries to create a database transaction and it blew up. 
And that's where we can tell, oh, you know what? Our validations never got updated. So we will go to our blog post model. We will look for validates body and we will replace this with content. And we can try submitting our form again. So this time I'm just gonna make it bold. We'll update our blog post and there we go. So now our scheduled post is updated or so we thought. And I checked, the text didn't change to bold. So that's weird, right? Well, another gotcha was that we forgot to update our permitted parameters. So our Rails logs has that big red message. It says unpermitted parameter content. So we also need to go to our controller app controllers, blog post controller, and change body here to content. Now you could definitely go through and uh, find and replace every mention of the word body to content, but it's important to see these errors and work through them because as a beginner Rails developer, you're gonna see a lot of errors. And even as a, pro a professional senior or staff Rails developer, you're gonna see a lot of errors. So being able to read those stack trace errors and find errors in your logs and all of that is good practice. So I wanna show you that as we go through this. And now we see if we save it, it is scheduled and it is bold, which is excellent. But if we go to our form here, this is not really supposed to look like it does. There should be icons for this and it should be styled to look like a form field. And the reason for that is the command currently has imported the action text CSS into our application Tailwind CSS, and it's not actually being loaded properly in there. So we're gonna go open up our application HTML.erb layout, and we're gonna copy our Tailwind line here, and we're going to tell it load the action text CSS file. So this was generated for us by um, installing action text. And this CSS file requires the tricks CSS, which is what powers that editor for us. And it includes some information about how to style the attachments that are uploaded through action text. And we just need to make sure that that is included in our layout as well so that it gets added um, to the UI. So we're gonna get rid of this inter font uh, style sheet tag because we don't need that in there and action text will do everything that we need. So if we refresh our page, voila, we now have a much better editor. It's a little bit wider than um, the prose style from Tailwind. So there's a little scroll bar here, but it does allow us to do things. Um, and we can also drag and drop images in here that will automatically be uploaded to our disk in development or test environments. And these will be saved through active storage, but connected through action text. And these are also separate database records that uh, display on our page. So that is pretty awesome. We can upload images, we can do all kinds of rich text things. And these features are basically free by using Rails and you get these features by just installing it and adding it to your models and your forms and your views, and you're good to go. Hey, Chris from the future here. I just wanted to mention, uh, when we were uploading an image into Action Text, it uses active storage, but active storage depends on a couple other dependencies that you might need to install on your system. So libvips is used for image processing to resize images, and that's something that Action Text will do. And then if you wanna embed a video, you can add FFmpeg on your system, and Poplar for PDF previews, so it'll render the PDF into an image and allow you to preview your PDF. Um, so these are three like system dependencies you might need to install if you'd like to use those future features. And I'm definitely showing you the images. So you'll want to run, if you're on a Mac, brew install vips and FFmpeg or Poplar, uh, and you can install all of those. I'm pretty sure I have all of them already um, here. So that's maybe if you see a difference on the uh, image uploads where maybe it doesn't render properly, it might be that your Rails logs show an error saying, hey, we don't have libvips, so we can't resize your image. Uh, but mine worked because I already had libvips already installed. So follow the instructions for your operating system to install each of these uh, dependencies if you wanna use video uploads or PDF previews, but you'll definitely wanna have libvips installed and that'll be already installed for you typically in production. So you don't have to worry about it when you're deploying to Heroku or Render or something like that. Anyways, that's it, bye. 
Now, when we deploy this to production, um, we are going to have file uploads in production that might be stored temporarily in our render server. But that server uh, is really a container that will get removed and replaced by a new one. So if you upload an image to that container, it's going to disappear the next time you deploy your code. So this image will work every time in development because it gets stored to our local disk. And then in production, it's best practice for us to upload files to a persistent storage service like Amazon S3, uh, Google Cloud Storage, Azure Storage, um, and all of these are listed out in the Active Storage uh, Rails guides. So we're gonna walk through setting up Amazon S3 for storage for production. And this is what you would do in a regular you know, job where you're setting up Active Storage. You would have it pointing to something like Amazon S3 um, for your files. And it's effectively like this infinite storage platform for you as well. So you don't have to worry about like, oh, we only have 50 gigs right now and somebody uploaded a five gig file and we over overloaded our uh, disk, Amazon S3 and these services are effectively infinite. So they're a transparent layer over top of the actual real servers where the files get stored. So they've got a bunch of features they add on top of that. Like you can encrypt things on disk. Um, you can make files private and public so they can't be accessed uh, without a token if they're marked as private, all kinds of cool stuff. And this is really what you wanna do for production. So we will set that up in the next video.